Hi, this is Amber. And this is Lisa. And you're listening to Unexplained Arkansas, a new podcast that explores urban legends, mysteries, and the unsolved in the natural state. We're just two best friends discussing the unexplained in Arkansas. And welcome to Unexplained Arkansas. This is Amber. And this is Lisa. And you are the... <laughs> and why we're do laughing. You make, why do you make me laugh every time you say this is Lisa? I was like, we're going to be really serious this time. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So this is actually the second part of our series on the West Memphis Three. We're going to, like I said, try to be serious. Um, we love to joke and all that, but we understand that yes. this is not something to joke about at all. Mm-hmm. And any humor that we put in is just making fun of each other. So, <laughs> yes. So, yes, it's we, so we love to do that. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So we are going to pretty much start where we, or pick up where we left off the other yes. day. So we're, yes. you know, we're going to start with, um, the investigation, the suspects. Yes. Correct. Mm-hmm. So Lisa's going yes. to walk us through all of that. And then I'm going to interject with a few questions that I have in my notes. So go ahead, Lisa. Start okay. us out. Okay, great. Yeah, we kind of left things off on May 6th of 1993. So we are going to spend some more time in 1993. Okay, so after, um, obviously, Once the police knew that this was a murder investigation, you know, things were extremely serious um, and extremely crazy. And, of course, the newspapers were, you know, all these headlines. I mean, people wanted answers. This was um, a huge crime, a horrific crime. Oh, yeah. um, They definitely wanted somebody arrested. I mean, that that was that that is true. Mm -hmm. I mean, searching everywhere, you know, clues and talking to people and, you know, just, just getting diving in. Okay. They were diving in. And of course, at the very beginning, they didn't really have, um, they didn't really know a lot, a whole lot, because like we mentioned, it took about two weeks or so to get the coroner's report. Um, and was this pretty quickly for a coroner's report? Is that standard? I mean, I would say from experience with that, (laughs) I mean, they waited two and a half weeks and I will say we waited to get like the autopsy and I want to say we waited three or four months. (laughs) So obviously the police do get things fast, but I would think that, that, you know, the autopsy um, report was pretty quick, pretty quick, but inspector uh, Gary Gitchell, you called him the Gitch. Uh, He was getting extremely frustrated just because he was the head of this investigation and he was obviously feeling the heat, you know, feeling it. And and I do, I've seen, I've seen that in real time. I've seen, Mm -hmm. you know, people in these kinds of, um, you know, positions, whether it be in law enforcement or municipal government, whatever, they do feel the heat because people want Mm -hmm. answers and they want them as fast as you can get them. Yes. And everyone was scared. Of course, they're scared about their kids, um, you know, playing outside and just, I mean, goodness, if that happened here in Cersei, I mean, I'd be like, sorry, Elle, you're not going anywhere, you know? Yeah. Um, it would just be awful. Um, just a, a very scary time frame. And of course, also, like we discussed in part one, you know, uh, of course, because of the newspapers and just the talk of the town. So everybody's speculating. They're thinking that this is cult activity or satanic activity because all they're hearing are all the rumors. So the rumor mill, you know, is building. So to kind of go along with that rumor mill, I'm going to kind of take you a little bit backwards. So immediately upon hearing about this happening, um, and we talked about where... (laughs) Sorry, I'm going to get lost here. Um, There are so many things right now. So we do have Jerry Driver. So we mentioned about the juvenile um, probation officer, Jerry Driver, in the last one, correct? Yes. Yes, we did. Okay. So Jerry Driver is going to be kind of a big part of this little section. So he immediately has someone in mind for these murders because 
he had been following um, a teenage boy named Damien Eccles. So uh, Damien... And by, by following, he was, was he the, his proba- probation person? Yes. Or how did he, that go? At one point, he was his probation officer. So okay. yes. So he had, so he had kind of been involved with Damien and you'll kind of, I'll kind of tell you about their history. Okay. Okay. So it, it and Damien's uh, full name was actually Michael... Hutchinson, I guess he had gotten adopted by his stepfather, who was uh, Jack Eccles. And so, and Damien no longer wanted to go by Michael. He wanted to go by Damien. So he was going by Damien Eccles at this point. Um, And at this time, he was 18, but Jerry Driver had been introduced to him. He was, he was a juvenile. So he was probably 17 or even 16 at the time that his relationship started. So it really, all developed like the first time that Jerry was aware of Damien um, was there was a call, I guess a, a mad mama had called into the police department because her daughter was messing around with a boy named Damien Eccles. And Damien was supposedly, um, allegedly, as you would say, uh, allegedly, alle- allegedly, um, just a bad, according to this mom, he was a bad kid. She wanted to to have a restraining order against him because he had been dating her daughter and she didn't like it. And she said that he was satanic and blah, blah, blah and that he had um, threatened to kill her. Like now, just, kid- just to be clear, okay. though, yes. I have mm-hmm. read his autobiography yes. and I forgot mm-hmm. the name of it. Now, he, um, according to the remember. autobiography, he was into witchcraft and all those mm-hmm. types of things, type of things yes. like magic, but not Satanism correct correct so he he claimed to be into wicca or witchcraft and and he himself had said that he was just really into magic into in general magic. and this is a side note but i hate magic what like i i hate magic like Why? i hate magic i hate i don't want to you know remember that chris angel is that his name oh like, you mean like the magic like david copperfield like a, kind of stuff like illusions yes. No, I hate okay. it all. Like I hate it all. Like I hate card tricks. <laughs> I hate card tricks. I hate illusionists. Like I hate it. And Daryl thinks that that is the most hilarious thing ever. That I hate magic. So, so you're just talking there about you like go. the the dude with like the top hat, the rabbit, right? I that hate it all. Like I hate, okay. I hate all magic. Oh, okay. <laughs> I do not discriminate against magic, Amber. I hate it all. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. And I'll tell people they're like, I'll show you a card trick, and I'm like, I hate magic, but I'll watch. <laughs> That's so funny. any anywho, that's weird. But um, I doubt so, it was just card tricks that was the issue oh, with no. that mom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she she was allegedly upset because I guess they had been dating and she wasn't happy about it. Then they kind of evidently broke up, or she was trying to break them up. And then Damien was saying that he was going to uh, kill the mom, or allegedly, you know, just kind of she was just upset about the situation. So that was oh, kind of the okay. f- yes. So that was kind of the first first thing you know and of course they go talk to Damien and you know this is just kind of a she said he said whatever well a little bit later on him and her daughter get back together and they're not happy about it and then she's calling back to the police station okay and I believe this was more like 92 like like 1991 1992 time frame okay right okay so I'm watching you and I'm like, what are you doing? What were you just doing? I'm still doing? thinking about, well, I'm thinking about the magic <laughs> Are you thinking about thing. magic? <laughs> I am. I'm like, well, what, I've never really had a real stance on that. I mean, you know mm. that I have a love and deep devotion to Stevie Nicks. And like on that one, like on that one show, you know, if I'm uh-huh. at her concert and they start playing Edge of 17, I'm going to uh-huh. have to have some twirling room, you know? I mean, that's just how it is. So yeah, and, I mean... <laughs> And now I'm going to, I'm going to, to laugh for a while. Okay. Well, Stevie Nicks guys, Stevie, yeah. L, you, ha- I almost called you L. Yeah. <laughs> Ambie has loved Stevie Nicks for an, a lifetime. Yeah. A since lifetime. we were kids. Yes. And I, I plan this, to go to her concert here in a few weeks. Maybe oh, I'm if sure I can you, find tickets. I'm sure yeah. you will. <laughs> Well, yeah. anyway, and yeah, I'm not even going to invite you because you know you made mm. that snide remark about better than Ezra. So. Oh, I sure did. Yeah, I was like, don't <laughs> expect, don't expect me to go to that. <laughs> Take me to see like 
Adele, we are getting way off topic, but Adele or Taylor Swift, even. I oh, don't Lord. Know. I mean, I like go. some Taylor, I'm a, but you I'm know, a, I'm a partial Swifty. Okay, a partial. I'm, a partial I'm like, Swifty. I'm not crazy, but okay, we are I'm definitely doing. getting off topic. Back to West <laughs> we're, Memphis. Yeah. We are so yes, West Memphis to Damien. So so Damien was on the radar, and like I said, so Damien ended up getting back together with this girl. The mom was upset. She calls back to the police department. Okay, and the police and she says that her daughter has run off with him. Like basically, and of course, everything's Damien's fault. Okay. Everything's Damien's fault. Well, so it's yeah, always mom is mad. No, I'm just I mean, she's well, no, mad. The, she's, she's mad. She's a mad mama. She's a mad mama. So they do, the police do end up finding. So, and I will, a little segue here. So Damien does live like in a trailer park. Like he, we're talking a, a very small two bedroom trailer. He had, um, you know, I guess he probably wasn't what she would want her daughter to be hanging out with. I guess he had he had dropped out of uh, high school. He had long, stringy black hair. He dressed all in black. So it he, wasn't just the magic thing. It might have been some classism <laughs> too. It probably, and I don't know if she also lived in that trailer park because he did. You, we'll kind of talk later on more about this, but most of the people that he that he associated with lived in the same trailer park with him or whatever. Right. So, so I don't know if it was necessarily that, but maybe just all, all of it put together, you know, he was evidently quote unquote weird with his love of, you know, witchcraft and whatever. Um, anywho. And he had chosen the name. Evidently he had chosen the name Damien because he was interested in all religions at one point, And he stated that he liked the name Damien because it was a Catholic <laughs> It's Daryl, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> That's Amber and me are in the same house today, but she's in my kitchen and Daryl just came in. <laughs> he opened the just... drawer over there and it made a noise. All right, oh, go ahead. Right. I'm listening. Hear. Okay. <laughs> so anyway, so Damien had chosen the name Damien because it was a Catholic priest. Okay. Well, and I remember people and, saying and not that from it was, the omen. <laughs> yes. That's what I remember. Like people saying yes. back then that it was because of the, the omen, the Damien yes. and the omen, which if you're not familiar with the omen, that's a horror Go movie where, yeah, it's a pretty good one. Yeah, I like it. Now that's one. one of the rare gems where I like the original and I like the remake. However, I don't like any kind of sequel work going on with that one. However, yeah, I don't either. Um, I don't. The, the Omen is about a little boy who is. Um, well, they don't know he's the that he's, Antichrist. Well, or, something like yes. that. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. But they don't know. The parents don't know. Yes. And who is in that? Is it Rock Hudson? I think it is. No, no, it's, it's Gregory Peck. Right? Oh, it is. Gregory it's Peck. Gregory Peck. Why do I think Rock Hudson? I anyway, don't yeah. know. Yeah. Well, both are pretty cute and they're kind of yeah. cute in that movie. <laughs> but anyway, okay. Or he's kind of <laughs> cute in that movie, not they. He. He. <laughs> yeah. Yes, he is. <laughs> um, but anyway, so, so yeah. So, and what were we talking? Okay. Yeah. So she was not happy about this. So they did end up. Oh, oh, and we're talking about Damien in the trailer park. So he did, he was different, quote unquote different. This is 1993. He dressed on black. He had the long stringy hair. He had dropped out of high school. He, anyway, just sounds like Pearl Jam to me. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> you can look at it from all avenues. I mean, but, but, just but that, mama, that, that description just sounds like somebody <laughs> that was very famous in like a Pearl Jam, like Metallica type. Man. Well, that well, that will definitely come in play soon. So, yeah. Oh, I heard Paris. So, anyway, so your house okay, is so very the, noisy, by the way. Oh, shut your <laughs> face! You just a minute ago, you were like, "I'm just enjoying all the silence, and I can sit here and." That work. is true. <laughs> correct. That's my that amber voice. Do you like my yeah. amber voice? <laughs> yes. So, anywho, um. The police were searching for Damien and his and his girlfriend because the mom had called and said that they had run off. And so they did find that the kids were hiding out in an abandoned trailer. Okay. Oh, man. And um, along with them was Damien's friend, and his name is Jason Baldwin. So that will, of course, we'll be talking about that soon. But Jason Baldwin mm -hmm. was best friends with Damien. So they did find the kids. Um, they ended up arresting them for like burglary and, um, oh, and also because the kids were kind of in the middle of a, uh, let's just say their pants weren't on when they found them evidently. Oh, okay. The kid, the, uh, him and his girlfriend. So not Jason, 
it's oh, a different okay. story. But just him and his girlfriend evidently were found. And so they got okay. got him for sexual exploitation and burglary or like breaking and entering type thing. So, oh, Lord. Yes. So this was kind of, you know, his first introduction or whatever into all this. So Damien was arrested and he did... um kind of right away they were like he he just said some weird things Damien did not have a good home life his family was um on what you would call public assistance Mm -hmm. and the I guess what you would call like the department of health had been called out to the home uh he had definite family issues and so when he was arrested and he was put into uh jail or the juvenile, uh, you know, detention center, they, Mm -hmm. he did talk, you know, some things and he was depressed. So they did send him to like a health, you know, mental health facility at that time because they Mm -hmm. were kind of obviously worried about him. Um, and so, you know, they did show that he was manic depressive. He did not seem to be any type of of harm, harm to anyone. He was, in fact, they talked about how respectful he was of just everyone, not only in the, the, the facilities, but also in the mental health, you know, he was just very respectful. He was nice. Uh, They did say that he didn't appear to be very good at math, but, but he was very intellectual, like language wise, like he spoke very well and he was very, he just seemed to be very smart. And I think he was very well read, even though he was, you know, a high school dropout. So they did start him on depression medicine. That was one thing that they did. Um, and then of course, because he was arrested, he, he is put on probation. So, and he's saying some things that are just, I I will admit, like, he's just saying things that are weird. He's talking about the cult or, or other people are saying, oh, he's into Satan tannic stuff or he's going to kill me or he's going to kill himself like this is the conversations that are being spread about Damien and this is kind of the thing that Jerry Driver is seeing and of course Jerry Driver was very all about how every problem was cultish you know um and Jerry was seeing that West Memphis at that time like he was seeing graffiti on bridges and stuff so he was very hyped up and very scared of satanic you know, activity. Um, yeah. So that was kind of his first thing with Damien. So this would kind of go on for months, kind of back and forth. Like Jerry just, it's almost a little bit like reading everything was a little bit like Jerry was obsessed with Damien. <laughs> In fact, Damien. Yeah. I kind of got that same, I got, I got same that vibe. same vibe from Mara's mm-hmm. book and I remember from Damien's yes. book too. Mm-hmm. It was he just, was just like, he was going to make those pieces fit. Yes. So he was just on him for like, and this is even like before 93, oh, like before, he was just, before. Yeah. oh yeah. Like Jerry Driver was all over him. I mean, he was always concerned that, that Damien was going to do something harmful to people or was responsible for running a cult activity. Like he was thinking that, that all these little teenagers were following Damien down a dark road type thing. So does that make sense? Like he didn't, did not want Damien around. In fact, Damien's family, so his mom ended up uh, moving the family to Oregon, which is where I guess like his, I guess this is Damien's real father lived. And so they kind of went, and again, there's a lot of dysfunction in his family. (laughs) Evidently it was really bad, but anyway, he, they moved to Oregon. So even in Oregon, Jerry Driver was still not letting Damien alone. He, you know, because he was the pro, yeah, because he was the probation officer, he did like, um, you know, have to check in with him, of course, and right. let him know where he was going. And so even when he told him he was moving, you know, he, like Jerry Driver called ahead to Oregon, like called ahead to the city where he was moving and just told them to be on the lookout for him like that. He was, you know, just just cultivating that he was a bad person, a bad seed, that he was going to be doing things that weren't legal or whatever. Um, and that he was just, you know, quote unquote, weird, strange into cult activity or say Satanism or whatever. So he got a bad rep even before he got to Oregon. Well, he wasn't in Oregon very long before his mom, you know, they were saying that Damien had threatened to kill them and blah, 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 and all this stuff. And no so way, who said they, that? 
This was any- Damien's family. So it wasn't okay. just Jerry Driver. So so Damien's family had called the police there and the police had been checking in on him because of Driver um, and mm-hmm. also because of, um, you know, of what he had said and the fact that he had been on probation here. So they were checking in on him and he and so they did have him put. I guess he had come back here like Damien was upset about living there. He wasn't happy. Um, He was having issues with, I guess, his family. And so he decided to move back to Arkansas and live with his stepfather, Eccles. Okay. So he was coming back to West Memphis. Okay. Okay. As soon, as soon as he gets to West Memphis, Jerry immediately kind of picks him up and he goes back into um, a mental health facility. So it's not that Damien did anything. It's just that according to Jerry, he needed, you know, he had, he had broken his probation because of him leaving the state and coming back and, you know, back and forth and all this stuff. So he put him back in a mental health facility. I think he spent a couple weeks there and this is definitely 92. And, and, um, he told, he gave Damien kind of three things to do. He said, Damien, you need to finish high school. You need to get your GED. And, um, I think the other items were like, you need to, you know, make sure not to get in trouble. And then also you have to like, just meet all of the things of his probation. So Damien, by the end of 1992, he had done all those things and he had turned 18. Okay. Oh, so Damien, so everything changes yes. when you turn 18 in that kind of, um, environment and that kind of, if you're in the DHS system and all of that. Yes. Yes. So he is 18 now. Um, and he did actually do the things that driver said, well, even though he did the things driver said, he driver was still like feeling like Damien was going to be trouble or still was trouble and, and whatever. So as soon as, so you know, fast forward to May, as soon as this crime happens, Jerry Driver immediately tells like Gary Gitchell and and the people that are working on this case about Damien Eccles. Okay. So Damien is actually um, interviewed for the first time. So he's interviewed several times about this, but he is interviewed like May 7th. Oh, oh, he's interviewed May 7th? No. May 7th. May 7th? I forgot about that. Yes. He is questioned by Steve Jones and a Lieutenant Sudbury on the 7th. And of course, he's saying, like, he doesn't know the kid. He doesn't know anything about it. And really, and then he's also, it looks like, again, (laughs) the very next day, they also wanted to talk to him. So whatever they, you know, he's, anyway, he just says, in fact, because Jason Baldwin had been close friends they know who jason baldwin is because of damien so they're also questioning jason baldwin okay so now, damien and jason baldwin say something about oh, yeah. him that i found was yes just i can't believe this like he wore metallica shirts and they used that yes as they supposed it well yeah jason this is talking about jason, jason. yes yeah mm-hmm. yeah damien dressed in all black and he did say later damien just said you know, he really liked black. He was told that he looked good in black and he was like, Hey, I'm going to, and he did have a black trench coat and it was just black is very I mean, slimming. <laughs> I am literally wearing a black outfit right now. <laughs> you do. You wear, you only wear black. You're like Johnny that, Cash. That is not fair. That is not a fair <laughs> statement. Did you see my shoes? They are pink. Uh, I, I didn't I'm look. Tr- I have a lot of pink in my wardrobe. <laughs> But no, I do have a lot of black. Black is, I mean, it's just everywhere and it's easy just to buy. It or is whatever. easy. Unless you and have a cat like me. Then yeah, it's, I, yeah. I carry around <laughs> roll brush. <laughs> carry around the roll brush. But anyway, so Damien just liked to wear black. And yes, Jason Baldwin, he wore band t-shirts. So Yes, um, which I wear like every day. Every day. And so I take personal <laughs> yeah. offense to mm-hmm, all of that to the, about the Metallica t-shirts to, and to all that. that discrimination. Every, yeah, I was listening to that on a podcast last year and they, they uh-huh. kind of went in depth about the Metallica t-shirts. I'm like, oh, mm-hmm. that makes me so mad. It really did. <laughs> yeah. Offensive, huh? Yeah. I'm sorry. Do you, okay. you want to? Do you want to cry? No, I'm not wearing one today. Usually, I, <laughs> you are. Yeah. No, you are I'm not. Wearing a, you're not wearing a band t-shirt. So yeah, how I like rude, to wear them. I like to wear them to work too, and people just oh. kind of look mm-hmm. and they're like, "Huh, what band is that?" Uh-huh. So yeah, <laughs> I like it. It's it's your thing. So yeah, it black is and thing. pink is my thing. You, you wear the band t-shirts and, and my Stevie Nicks t-shirts too. Oh goodness, Stevie Nicks! <laughs> <laughs> I got a new I, one a I, couple of weeks ago. 
I like some Stevie Nicks. I did tell you that Elle and them are doing a tap dance to Landslide. Anyway. Oh, that's yeah. sweet. And I'm pretty sure it's the Stevie Nicks one. I think it's the the good one and not the, the, the what do we call them now? The chicks? I don't think it's the chicks version. But anyway, that will come up later too. Okay, so stay I was going to say, um, she's in all this mm-hmm. too. Mm-hmm. She, <laughs> isn't she always? Okay, yeah. so... So on the 10th, Damien is actually polygraphed um, by, again, and polygraphed Sudbury, by the yes, West he's, Memphis Police Department or yes, by the state? Is, no, by the West Memphis. Remember, they, they declined oh, help. Oh, no, by the, state police. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's right. Mm-hmm. I'm with you now. I'm with yeah, you now. we talked about that. Um, so, yes. yes. So he was polygraphed, um, and it did show supposedly, allegedly, and I... I don't even get me started on polygraphs because anyway, there are so many instances where the police just, I I understand their use of a polygraph, but a polygraph is inadmissible in court. Most of the time the police just use it. Um, I think is leverage (laughs) or whatever, but but I kind of agree to that. I agree. I I, I agree with that statement. I think it's used as more of a leverage tactic. Yes, it is. It is definitely a leverage tactic. And if you're in law enforcement, message me or talk to us about this. I just, anyway, I've had my own yeah, experience with wrong. this and I, I've just had yeah. my own experiences with this. And from everything I read in this case, you know, ever and everybody that in any case that we've watched, you know, they talk about how it's inadmissible and blah, blah. But they did say to Damien that, you know, or about Damien, that it was, it showed signs of deception. So hmm. during, and this was on the 10th. Um, so we're in May. So it did say that even his mom was interviewed and she on the 12th. So on the 12th, Pam Eccles, Damien's mother was interviewed and she told the police exactly what Damien was doing the night of the fifth, which he was, I mean, he was home. He had people around him. He, in fact, he, he did even have what you call alibis because he had been on the phone all night with two different girls like he had been talking uh, and he was dating this girl other girl well i think hey, that was none, it. Of my, I, I, none of my business <laughs> none of my business i th- okay I'll, I'll tell you this um at the time of anywho I, i'm gonna i'm gonna get to that but yes i think okay. damien had a lot of girls that he talked to Evidently, he was a very, I, I think he was one of those sensitive souls and girls just probably wanted to get to know him. So it, yeah, from, yeah. from all of my research, he was always into the girl or had a lot of girls. So he, that night, I don't know if they were just friends or whatever, but he was literally talking to, to two girls. Um, yes. Now, so. Okay. So I have a question. I thought he had a child. I thought he had had a child. You are jumping ahead. Oh, oh. <laughs> Sorry. I thought we were on May 7th, 1993. Did this happen after We that? are. Yes, oh, okay. yes. I won't say anything else. I'm, I'm going to spank you. Oh, Lord. I'm, now I'm thinking. I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to come in there, Amber. I'm going to come in there and get... No, I'm just kidding. Okay, so uh, like I said, on the 12th, Pam Eccles is interviewed by the police, and she she tells them exactly what Damien was doing. And again, he had an alibi. He was he was busy. He had people like you could look at phone records. He you could talk to the people. There were girls that had yes, he was busy. Um, now enter into a different picture. This is on a different different thought. So, and I'm going to go a little bit backwards, but I'm going to I'm going to talk to you about someone named Vicky Hutcherson. Okay. Oh, yeah, I've heard that name. Uh, yes. Yeah. So Vicky, actually on May 6th or May 7th, she was had already been called into the police department because she was supposed to give a polygraph because her the company that she worked for had turned her in for stealing. They they Oh Vicky. Oh Vicky, yes. So she was evidently new to West Memphis. Um she was had been working for, I think it was like a trucking company or something. And she had, she was coming into the police department to do a polygraph about some alleged money that was allegedly stolen by her. Okay. So this is her situation. Well, wow. when she came into the police department, this was after it, it must've been either later in the day on the sixth or on the seventh, it was like right in that window. And she had her son with her name, Aaron. Okay. so. Aaron was with her. He was kind of distracting of the police. The police were kind of like, are you kidding me? You brought your kid. Well, she was a single mom. What was she supposed to do? Hey, I, you know, you know I, I mean, I have to <laughs> drag my kids all over the place. I, you know, I get yes, it. Like, I get it. I don't, I don't fault Vicky at all for that. That, that is what it is. But evidently she, I think 
she was trying and evidently Vicky was a very striking woman. She is described as 5'10, 130 pounds, red hair and blue eyes, like or green eyes. She was she was a very striking figure. Um and so I think that she was trying to um probably use her womanly wiles with the police and then she also hmm. was yeah, I mean we've never done that before. And then she's No, not me. <laughs> um and then she maybe to get something free at, at like a you know a restaurant and maybe i've gotten some free cheese dip or something no i'm just kidding i'm not kidding that did happen but anyway um so oh, moving for, moving forward moving moving forward so she says she interjects this because i think she's trying to you know smoke and mirrors this thing and she's like hey my son knew those boys like he was friends with those boys immediately she is interjecting Aaron into this situation with the boys. And he's and probably of course, like, shut up, mom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, he would be eight years old like these boys. And so he's just yeah. probably scared to death in this police department. And I'm sure his mom's just oh, like, yeah. here's my boy. He knew them. And he, so evidently That's Aaron. Awful. Uh, mm. I know. Uh, don't, e- don't even get me started. So you'll, this will come up over and over, but Aaron evidently tells the, the police at that time that he saw the boys. Okay. He says, he said that they were playing at some, there's some playground in the woods and that's where he had seen them or something. And so the police were like, Oh, wait a minute. You know, like, what is this? And then Aaron tells them that the boys were talking to some man that he had seen them talking to some man. And then, so later on, so the police kind of honed in on Aaron and Vicky and talking to them. And in fact, at that time, maybe a little bit later, a couple weeks later, by the 19th of May, Vicky, who lives beside this person uh, named Jesse Miss Kelly. So she she lives next door to this Jesse Miss Kelly Jr. So mm-hmm. she is saying to the cops, hey, Jesse knows Jason Baldwin and them and I can get maybe I can go undercover and help you all, you know, catch, you know, or get more information about Damien and Jason. So that's what she is telling the cops on the 19th. And of course, Aaron between the 7th and the 19th has told the cops all kinds of things. He's told, I mean, his stories get more elaborate as the time goes by, but you know, at the very first, he says he saw the boys or that they were at the, the, um, on a, in a playground in the woods. And then he's like, no, I saw him with the boy. And then, no, I was there. I saw so him. His so his story kept changing. He, yes. Aaron's story kept changing. And with every single little thing he would tell the cops between May 7th and June, you know, second, let's say was just getting more and more crazy. Okay. But the hmm. cops were eating this up because already on their mind was Damien, his little friend, Jason Baldwin, and so mm-hmm. now Vicky, Vicky has introduced Jesse Miss Kelly into this. So allegedly, allegedly, so she, um, and this comes up, sorry, let me look at this real fast. Okay. So it comes up with, with Vicky that she, like Jesse introduced her to Damien. So this has happened after the 19th. Okay. So she tells the police that Damien drives her and Jason Baldwin was, evidently with with them as well and jesse was with them so he drives her out to some sort of satanic worship slash orgy and oh gosh she, yes and she gets there and she tells them immediately that she wants to leave that's what she tells them but but basically she tells this story that she was with them that they drove her out to this place and there was definitely like people out there and they were naked and they were doing weird things and they were all into satanic cult activity. So that's, that's what Vicky tells the cops. Okay. Okay. So, (laughs) wow. Yes. So this is kind of, of course, again, the cops are like, Oh my goodness. Like, yes, this makes so much sense because obviously Damien is a Satan worshiper and he's a cult leader. And you know, this, this makes all kinds of sense. And this, these deaths have to somehow be related to that. Okay. According to their train of thought. So now they have, so I will say June 3rd, they do set up a a meeting with Jesse, Miss Kelly. Okay. And I will, and let me go back a little bit. So Jesse, Miss Kelly lived next door to Vicky. Okay. I believe at this time, 
he was 16. He was a dropout from, from high school as well. Um, later on, it would be said that he had a, an extremely low IQ. He basically uh, had the schooling of maybe a third or fourth grader. Okay. Jesse was very simple person. He kind of looked, he didn't look all dressed in black. He didn't have the the black fingernail polish or whatever, like Damien did. He did look a little punkish, I guess. He had a really mm-hmm. weird haircut or whatever. I mean, he was just a kid and he also lived in a trailer park. They, these are all like low, low income people here. Okay. Um, so well, it says here but, that his, and, mm-hmm. and I thought this was it, but I was looking it okay. up to make sure it said that his IQ is 70. Um, so again, this is June 3rd. I'm on June 3rd. Okay. So, oh, and I had, and I talked about Jesse Miss Kelly. So Vicky had actually, dur- during the same time frame that he is allegedly taking her out with his friend Damien, you know, to orgies and satanic cults. Like during this time, she gets scared and she had called him over to help her with her kids. Okay. So, oh, wow. so yeah. So that that's who I'm going to call the babysit. I know. Not. So this, so allegedly she's thinking that he's this quote unquote bad person that she's talking to the police about, but yet but she feels safe she'll enough. She'll still use him for, or as a babysitter. Hmm. Yes. Like she had him come oh, over and Vicky. stay with, yes. So that makes a lot of sense. Doesn't it? Yeah. So as you can see, Jesse was not a true threat. I mean, he, he had never been in trouble or, you know, any, any type of big trouble. He just was low income and he was low IQ. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the police do bring him in. I think they did get permission, you know, from Jesse, Miss Kelly senior to talk to Jesse because Jesse is, you know, he is not 18. So Damien's 18. Um, but Jesse is more like, I believe he was 16 at this time. So, um, so they bring Jesse in and the police interrogate. And I say interrogate Jesse for 12 hours. No, gosh. That's 12 awful. hours without that, an attorney, without a parent. Okay. Did his so parents know what was him. going on or his, his what dad or, or even what it was related to? Like his dad had given them permission to talk to him, but oh, I don't think okay. his dad would have even, I, these people were very simple people, period. And I, they didn't understand all of this or the ramifications of such. Like they were like, oh, or yeah. uh, answer their questions. Well, after 12 hours of interrogation, there is only about 45 minutes caught, you know, on like taped, like actually recorded of this 12 hour period. But in that 12 hour period or, or sometime, I don't know how long within it, Jesse, Jesse goes from saying that he has no knowledge he does not know the kids, the three boys, because that's what the police are after. They're interrogating him about the murders, of course. And he is saying to them, he has no knowledge. He does not know the kids. And then, you know, the police would keep on and keep on. And he'd be like, well, you know, and, and after a little bit, he started well, maybe to tell I them do. stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Maybe and- I do know them. Maybe, maybe yeah. Damien and, and he's, and so then he does give a, I guess you would call it a, what do you call those? <laughs> a confession I am out here. A confession. Yes. He then all of a sudden he is he is telling them stuff like, well, yeah, he you know, I I did this or yeah, we we took the kids into the woods, but I didn't do anything. And then, you know, and then oh, he tells okay. them. Yeah. Yeah. So he does start to tell the police what um, they you know, want to hear, but he's trying to keep yes. himself out of it. Yes. So he does tell them that they are there in the woods at 9 a.m. on the 5th. And then the cops come back and say, "Um, are you sure it's on the 5th? (laughs) Well, are you, are you sure it was morning? And he's like, oh no. Now all of a sudden he says it's noon. And then the, 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 you know, the cops know that the kids were in school that day on the 5th. And so they say, well, were you know was this after school and then jesse literally says this is recorded he says i didn't go to school so jesse's mind you know just like this is his mind <laughs> okay so the and then the and then the cops are like no i mean you know after you know the kids were in school they were in school and he was like oh well i guess it was it was after school and then all oh, of wow. a sudden the the cops know the time frame. And then, so Jesse starts to reveal 
you know, things. He does say that, you know, Damien and Jason, you know, did kill the boys. He says that they were tied up with rope, you know, and we did talk about and how it wasn't kids... rope. It was shoestrings, right? Yes. And he's also at the, and so again, at this point, he's saying, you know, yes, they were cut. Yes, they were this or that. He is saying things to because he thinks that this is going to make the cops happy it's he thinks it's what they want to hear yes he is saying exactly what they want to hear and he Mm -hmm. does implicate um himself he does say that michael moore was trying to get out of the woods it was the three boys in the woods with them and michael moore is trying to get out of the woods and he does he implicates himself as stopping michael moore So that's what Jesse's confession is. But that Jason, he actually lays a lot of the act out Jason Baldwin soon. So, so like a little bit on Damien, a lot Mm -hmm. on Jason Baldwin, as far as the deaths of the boys, but he does implicate himself by saying that he grabbed, you know, up uh, Michael Moore. So he detained him. So of course, again, Jesse's, you know, has been there 12 hours, you know, no representation, you know, Anywho, like he, this is what he's saying. That part of this is just, you know, Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's terrible. It's terrible. It should not, everyone, especially someone at that age should have representation there with them, should have a parent with them. Mm -hmm. And I would say, and I don't, you know, obviously 1993, I I would pray that things are so much different now. Mm -hmm. Um, But can you imagine like, I mean, my kid, L, your kid, Bo, you know, they are 16. So they're about the age of, yeah. of Jesse. They actually probably have very high cues, you know, so, so not like Jesse, Jesse was a dropout. He had a very low IQ. They would probably, I mean, if the police picked them up and they were interrogated by themselves, like they wouldn't know that they can walk out of the room. They no, wouldn't know they their wouldn't. legal rights. No, they you wouldn't. know, that is, they would have that is no true. clue. No clue whatsoever. And I don't think even Jesse's dad was a sophisticated enough of a man or, you know, experienced enough to know. Well, his not, maybe not legal law rights. enforcement and all that. Yes. So. Yes. As far as any... that, that knowledge, I think he was a mechanic and Jesse had kind of been working with his dad as a mechanic and that's what they knew. That's what they were good at, you know? So they, they would not have known what their legal rights were. So Upon getting, immediately upon getting this confession, okay, from Jesse, Mm -hmm. of course the cops are like, home run. Like, they are, you know, high-fiving. And yes, they they are extremely happy. Like, this is what they've been oh, leading I remember up to the presser that the one guy gave and they said how sure are you and and i forgot what he <gasps> said it, don't even it was like, don't don't even oh. say it don't even say it oh don't say it yet gonna, okay. yes all right that's part of it. <laughs> i'm gonna this is you. why you need to give me my <laughs> give me a script or something so i'll know what not to say <laughs> okay i'm gonna just what not to say have you anyway that reminds me of that show what not to wear anyway yeah i love that I, show I, I told my sister i was gonna turn her into it <laughs> oh my god well, that's Dee, a different she'd story. probably turn <laughs> she'd probably turn me out to that show too. But. Do you? You? Yes, I would. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. so anyway, so the cops are high fiving. They they're okay. They are going crazy. So this would be so we are still on June third. Okay, so of course the police are like, we have to get warrants out for you know Damien and then Jason Baldwin so just to kind of give you kind of a time frame i mean it was very mm-hmm. late so the cops are are going to a judge and and normally there was something that i read and it was like normally it was very very difficult to get any type of warrant for cuz they were going to go search their house and and pick them up so they immediately do this at night and the judge allowed them to do this and this was very out of the ordinary like normally you had to wait until the daytime or whatever so they immediately go to the trailers in fact jason is actually from what i understood jason was actually over at damien's house and so they ascend on damien's trailer they are um taking all the stuff you know immediately like for evidence and whatnot they're they arrest jesse they you know they're already they're they're arresting the boys okay so this is uh, the 3rd of June and the boys are arrested, period. Okay. So that is just about less than a month after the yes. initial crime. 
Yes. So, so the next morning, so this is what, what you're thinking out about. So Gary Gitchell, the next morning. Oh, that was Gitchell hold- that said that? Yes, it was. Like, I remember when the that Gitch. happened. <laughs> yeah, the Gitch. So the next morning, of course, they are thrilled. And of course, you know, everyone's been scared, the whole community. So Gary Gitchell has a press conference as he's good about doing. And one of the reporters asked him this question. They say, you know, how, how good are these suspects from one to 10? Like, how good is this case? And what does he say, Amber? Do you um, remember? He said, uh, what did he say? 11? Yes. He said 11. Uh, he just okay, sits there and just smugly says, 11. Oh yeah. Yeah. I remember <laughs> yes. that. Yes, you I were do probably drinking that. coffee and watching news with my with, granny. With granny. Yes, I there was. you go. Yes. yes, so that's so that's what's happening um, on June. Actually, it was summertime, so, so that I was probably sleeping late. Yeah, by then we were out of school because I remember so you, the summer after this happened, and that's you know the satanic panic in our area was yes. at a fever a fever pitch for sure. So yes, that that is very true. <laughs> So they go into, so yeah, so that was the the fourth when Gitchell has his press conference and says what he says. And so by the seventh, the judge appoints um, the defendant's attorney because these boys, they don't have two nickel. What do they say? They don't have two nickels to rub together. They have no money. So they yeah. get court appointed attorneys. And um, that's a very important piece to this puzzle as well. They, yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, in fact, um, Dan Stidham, I believe that's how you say his name, is um, the the attorney for Miss Kelly for Jesse, um, and he actually ends up uh, he 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 is in the documentary The Paradise Lost. You'll see him. He he looks like a friendly teddy bear actually, Aww. but he he is very involved with it. And so he goes into this actually. He very much thought that his job with Jesse was just to get a lesser sentence because. Uh, and I will say this, and I skipped this very important detail. So right away, right after Jesse confesses and gets arrested, he immediately recants his confession. Like oh, he wow. recants it right away. <laughs> right, right, right. Okay. He said that he had lied and he recants it right away. Um, he just says that, you know, the police kind of like just he thought that he was telling them what they wanted to hear. He thought it was a game. He thought that, in fact, he literally says, I just thought this was a game. I thought that they just wanted me to play it because they knew I was innocent. That's what he says. This is Jesse's own words. Okay. Okay. So I will, I will go on and say um, something I'm, I didn't even think about. So during the investigate or during the interrogation of Jesse, the police had told Jesse about the $35,000 reward for like helping to capture whatever happened to the boys. And that was also <laughs> so something weird about that. So Vicky and Jesse would later discuss that, that they, you know, they were just under the assumption that they would help, you know, they, they just wanted the reward money, but in a, inevitably Jesse would actually lead to, you know, a his confession. Arrest. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. A, a false confession that he would recant and then his arrest. So, but there was a $35,000 reward out for anybody that helped, you know, during that time. So, okay. So the prosecutor um, for the case, I will go into a little bit of this. So um, there is a judge involved. Um, so his name, where is that? I am terrible, Amber. No comment. I'm going to get you. Okay. Okay. So sorry. Okay. So the judge is David Burnett. Okay. So David Burnett is the judge. Um, John Fogelman is actually the prosecutor. And I will say John uh, Fogelman um, is actually, he was aware or he was the prosecutor. So he had actually prosecuted um, Damien on his stuff. So he was kind of already aware of Damien. Excuse me. So what charges did Damien have before? Did you see what charges... That, yes. Uh, so, okay. so the only charges that he had had because of that, him going out with his 
girlfriend at the time, like, and being in that trailer. So they got him for, like, I believe it was sexual um, misconduct and, like, breaking and entering, like, burglary. Even though nothing was taken, they were just, I guess, in this abandoned trailer. They still... And they probably didn't say that, oh, well, it was his girlfriend. He was still technically a teenager. Well, you know, yeah, they probably... Didn't go into the nature of the charges when when they mm-hmm. were telling that. So. Exactly. Like, it was just something to kind of... Not to say that's okay, Daniel, but I'm just saying that, sure. you know, as far as, as the assault charges and stuff, I think that does make a difference in in some of it, I think, in some yeah, of the legal it, stuff. Yes. And it wasn't really... they didn't. I don't think they charged him for assault. It was just like sexual exploitation, but they didn't actually file charges against the girlfriend, just Damien. So I think it was oh. a way to get Damien at that time. Cause you know, he was already on, on, um, drivers, you know, the juvenile, uh, officer, uh, whatever he is mm-hmm. officer, he was on his radar already. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm looking at you. Okay. So by August. Okay. So this is in June, whenever these, you know, the attorneys are assigned. So the attorneys are getting to work on, you know, the cases of the boys. And they do decide right away because of Miss Kelly's confession that he is going to be tried separately from, you know, Damien and and, uh, Jason. So Damien and Jason are going to be tried together, but Jesse is going to be tried on his own. So they were basically putting all their money on Jason, or not Jason, on uh, Miss Kelly's Jesse's mm-hmm. testimony to put the other two away. Yes. And immediately upon arresting them, of course, they're going to take all the samples. They take hair samples. They take blood samples from all the boys. They got fingerprints. They got shoe prints. They got all the prints on all three boys. Does that make sense? So yes, all, all of that is being taken in to account. And, and at the time there really wasn't a lot at the, at the scene of the crime, there wasn't a whole lot of, things left but there were things i mean there was like the shoelaces there were things that were would have everything being underwater that did hurt the um you know getting evidence and and all of that correct i i think there yes i think that well i think there's always that problem but but there were there was quote-unquote evidence to be tested but in 93 i think there wasn't i think there was a little bit of testing that they could do this would kind of come in later you know there would be more testing later to come but at this point they did take all of the boys stuff i mean we're talking like the hair the blood the all all of it so uh, the boys did give that and so at that same time i guess immediately upon oh and i need to also let you know so immediately upon this whole situation so two men um would come into into the lives of West Memphis. Okay. So a Joe Berlinger and then, and I don't, I hope I said that right. And then a Bruce Sanofsky. So they were documentary people. So they were directing and producing and editing, editing a documentary that they wanted to make about this case. Okay. So they wanted a whole, a whole thing. So they are filming like right off the bat, they're filming and they're interviewing you know, the families, uh, the, they did get permission. They're going to be allowed to go into the courts. Okay. So just to kind of give you that little tidbit. So a documentary, uh, these two guys were filming this whole, this whole stuff, all of this, all this stuff going on. So this is in, I think they would have started in 93, 94. Okay. okay. With the filming. So, um, so yeah, so by, so June, they're arrested. They're given their attorneys. There is also another man that comes into the picture uh, that later on we'll talk about too. So his name is Ron Lax. So I guess he saw Ron Lax was a a very high falutin. <laughs> um, high falutin. I will say he was high falutin. <laughs> um, he was described as a uh, huh, very very hot, fancy and very nicely dressed and such, but he was, uh, he had a private investigation firm. In fact, he had, uh, he had gotten so big, he had two firms. He had one in Memphis and one in Nashville. Uh, but I guess he, he lived in Memphis. Um, but it was called inquisitor, his, his private investigation firm. And he had a, a such a huge firm and, and I guess such a, an ability that he did take on pro bono cases. And so immediately, 
upon finding out about the arrest of the boys. Like his name is Ron Lax and he would be, in fact, the Devil's Not movie that was um, made in like 2014 would actually center around Ron Lax and he would be played by Colin Firth, who oh. I was in love with for such I a long like time. I like Colin Firth. Oh. Oh, the original Mr. Darcy. Oh. Yeah. Well, Reese Witherspoon was really good in that movie as well. And that's it. I mean, yes, she, you know, she's a great actress. It was the movie the was best not movie. Yeah, I mean, the movie eh. did not stick to the. I mean, it was based off of Mara's book, but it was. I got a little very annoyed with Reese's Arkansas loose. accent, though. I mean, just a just a wee bit, and I love Reese, but I'm like, really, she's do a, we sound like that? <laughs> no, she's a well, she's, she's a Tennessee person, so she's, she's not she's too. not too far away from she's from not us. too far away. <laughs> She's not. For, but to me, some people in Tennessee kind of sound like Kentucky and Tennessee, for me, have like a vibe with their accents. I mean, they have like kind of a big Yeah, accent. I agree. But I'm not one. I mean, and I've even been told that I do not sound like I'm from Arkansas. Like people can't determine oh, where I my do. accent is from. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm like, I don't, I don't know. I was born in Missouri. So uh, what can I say? Midwesterner? I don't know. Midwesterner. Whatever. So anywho, um, Ron Lax would immediately go and give his efforts to the defendants. Like he would help all of the attorneys. Okay. So like I said, Dan Stead Stidham uh, was actually Jesse's attorney. Um, and then you had Damien's attorney was Val Price and Scott Davidson. Um, and then I don't have a note on Jason Baldwin's attorney. So we'll get back to that. But yes, so they were all given these attorneys. Oh, and oh, can I also say something here? So they sure. did uh, right away the judge, like, of course, they're, I mean, their attorneys are kind of doing everything they can for them. But the uh, like Stidham right away wants to throw out Jesse's confession and, and the judge says no. So he says the the judge is not going to allow Jesse's admission, you know, his confession not to play a part. And then also the attorneys are trying to get it to where the the boys are not tried as adults. Now, I will say Damien was 18, but, you know, Jesse was not. And then Jason was not. So. They are trying to get these boys not to be tried as adults. And that, you know, that didn't happen. Yeah. Either. And that makes a lot so, of difference. What, you know, what will happen? Yes. So I think just the severity of the crime and just the fact that this was such a high profile and just such a horrendous crime, it was like, no, mm -mm, no, this is, they were, they were going after it. So, um, and again, the prosecutor was John Fogelman. Um, and so he was, you know, working on it. And it looks like this is in, so all through September, you know, things are working on it. Now they did decide in November that actually Jesse was going to be tried in Corning, Arkansas, which is so not too far away from West no, Memphis. No, it's not too far. I mean, it's and what it's was in the a purpose different... of moving the trial just because everyone had heard, you know, there was not yes. anybody that yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. They felt like it was such a high profile case that there would be no way to have kind of a quote unquote fair trial without that. So they did, yeah. oh, I they agree. did move. I it totally to agree with that. Mm -hmm. And they did uh, go ahead and say that, the, you know, and that oh, they did decide. So Corning was decided. And then um, Damien and Jason's trial was going to take place in Jonesboro. And Jonesboro is about an hour. In fact, we were over in Jonesboro last night. Yesterday, so, weren't you? Yeah. 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 My, my friend Julie, we were talking about that. And uh, Julie is from Jonesboro. And she said, yeah, this is very, this case is very kind of hard and difficult for multiple reasons. But, you know, it happened in her town. Um, you know, the trials did. And so right. it's about an hour from West Memphis was what she was saying. You know, 45 minutes or so. Yeah. So it's yeah. not too far away, but it is in a different county. So basically they were putting these trials in the different counties surrounding you know, Crittenden County where West Memphis was um, just because of the, the high profile and, and nature of the case. And so it was decided um, basically they would start the trial for Miss Kelly in about January of 1994. So that's when they would start the trials and kind of right away. So, you know, Lax is helping, he's investigating, he's talking to people. Um, he's interviewing. In fact, 
it does say that Ron lacks interviews all the neighbors of Hutcherson and is told that Aaron Hutcherson, which was a very big part of the case against Miss Kelly and against the boys, he, they were saying that he was actually at the trailer park the whole time of the murders and not in Robin Hood Hills witnessing the murders because eventually Aaron's test, you know, his yeah, they were you know, vital the, parts of the of the whole thing yeah yes like him you know between vicky his mom and then his testimony uh because there would come to find out there would be no physical evidence i mean no physical evidence and that's a very tie. important that that is very important to to say you know the lack mm-hmm. of the the physical evidence yes like there was absolutely no physical evidence between them so without this confession and then without these uh witnesses so to speak there was there was really nothing going on uh so they did in january they did select the jury so this was january 18th they select the jury for um jesse miss kelly's trial and then it looks like um on a side note entrance so i had told you that the documentary had been going on like yeah which would okay. play a huge role in, you huge. know, yeah, in yes. the future. So, yes. So the documentary people have been, you know, interviewing. And, and one of the people that was really loved the camera was John Mark Byers. Uh, oh, Chris yeah, Byers he did. Death. Yeah, that is true. And if, and if you have seen any of the films. Um, then you've seen you know that. John Mark. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you have, you've literally seen him singing. You've seen him, you know, he was yeah. very in he front of the camera. He was very much in front of the camera. Yes. Uh, evidently now, he was. Now a, the other ones, like, not so much. Oh no. And in fact, not, not uh, Michael Moore's much. parents, like hardly any in the first one. Um, and then even uh, Pam Hobbs, not so much. Um, a little bit in the first first documentary um but it does say that um so john mark had actually given a knife as a christmas gift Mm -hmm. to one of the the producers of the documentary and it kind of looked like it had blood on it so interesting yeah so um the producers turned it over to the police (laughs) really now how did i miss that i don't remember that was that i don't know it was mara's book yeah, it was wow. in the book and it was in, uh, it was also in the documentaries. Yes. Oh, yeah. So, um, yes. So they kind of, yeah, that was kind of something weird and they just didn't feel right about it. And and they would test um, this knife, of course, for DNA. And it looked like, or, or not DNA, like blood. I'm sure they were looking at blood at this time, but the it did say that the blood or the whatever was on it did match christopher byers oh wow but it also matched john mark so it was you know it was that type of you know this wasn't like a match match type of thing like basically um it was to have blood consistent with both of them and they were not biologically related well that's what that was my next question were they oh Hmm. okay no i don't in fact i don't think that he was even married or or with Chris Byers mom until he was four. So they were not biologically related, but yet the blood was consistent with both of them. So, and then John Mark did say that he had gotten cut. Like it was a honey knife. I will say that it was a honey knife um, that was given as the present. Now, is that what, that's just weird to give a honey knife with blood on it. Like a little bit to to someone as a Christmas gift in general, like someone you just met. (laughs) Yeah. But anywho, I mean, he whatever. Was a, he was a different, he, he was a different cat though. Yeah. I mean, John, that, that John Mark true. was definitely out there. And when you're watching, like, you know, I do, I do definitely feel like people should go watch the paradise lost or, and then there's another one we'll mention. Well, I would use the word eccentric probably, mm-hmm. but people could describe me as that too. Yeah. What? <laughs> you didn't have to agree so fast. I'm like, what? No. Yeah. Um, you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, he, <laughs> during this time, you know, they're just trying to get ready for a trial. And I will say the whole time that they're trying to get ready, like the, the defense, like the prosecution 
is supposed to give everything to them. Well, evidently they do give them stuff, but it is months after they've already had it. And when they get items, it mm-hmm. was a big mess. Like nothing was in order. I mean, you know, already the the defense isn't even being paid. They have to get reimbursed, you know, Um None of their, you know, they pretty much have to ask for es- experts to to work on pro bono. Well, yeah, you know, yeah, Ron yeah. Lax is working pro bono for them. I mean, you know, when you have state defenders, like there's not a huge budget for this, and no. and the prosecution they know this, and they're just basically giving they're giving them the information, but it was a big hot mess, and several months late by the time that they would get documentation okay um so they really it was just very difficult for the defense um in general uh so they do have it looks like bear with me okay so (laughs) so in oh well goodness it it pretty much i will say jesse's jesse's whole trial is is pretty quick (laughs) so how many days is his trial do you know yeah, it's very fast. Um, so let's just put it this way. So the the jury was selected on Jesse's um deal January eighteenth. And then um after just a, a couple of weeks, I mean literally two or three weeks, he is convicted. Oh and, wow. Yes, and he is being tried, you know, for capital. And there's no physical the th- evidence. No physical evidence. Um, so yes. So he, you know, they basically, the prosecution gets up and, you know, they, they show the autopsy, um, you know, pictures of course, which are just awful. And then of course they, they do, uh, get to play on the tape, Jesse's confession. And then they do, uh, discuss, you know, Vicki Hutcherson. Um, I will say Dan Stidham, he tried, you know, it, it did, It does film the trial and you can see, so he does try his, but I will say he's a very like soft spoken individual. Does that make sense? I mean, and he, and he said himself, I mean, he was very new to this situation. I mean, it wasn't like he had ever tried a case like this in court. Like this was not something that he had, he had done before. I will say the prosecution had been working at that point for like, 10 years or so like he had been a prosecutor for 10 years um and yeah dan just didn't have a lot of just experience with this i will say you know he did try to call an expert witness that was working kind of a pro bono for him um like a dr offshay that would speak in the documentary and such and you know dr offshay would would try to tell you know, try to compel the jury to understand, you know, the situation, you know, and that it was the interrogation was really just very, you know, pushy. I mean, his, his confession was basically only after they told him information. And then also he, he didn't know about the, you know, the shoe strings. He didn't know. I mean, there was just a lot of questions that Dan tried to bring up and the fact that there was no physical evidence. and then all these things but, but the uh, the only that what they have from Jesse was mm-hmm. led led by that investigator. Yes, it was very led. And so they did try their best, but in the long run this jury said no. So that he was convicted. So Jesse was convicted. Um and so we're going to kind of you want to end there on that sure. note. Okay. Sure. Well, and I do remember, and maybe we could talk about this um, okay. yeah. on the next one, Yes, but there was an expert, quote unquote expert on mm-hmm. satanic cults and mm-hmm. things like that. And yes, and his, that would his, come up in the next trial. Yes. Oh, it'll mm-hmm. come up in the next trial. Yes. Okay. in Damien's trial. Yeah. Okay. Cause they didn't okay. really like in Jesse's the, everything that was brought up was basically centered around the fact that he had confessed. So okay. that, and that was really central. And again, and we had, we talked about this. I mean, it's really hard to understand, like, why would someone confess to something they didn't do? But what Dan was trying to get them to understand was that he was just so like pushed, like this was a 12 hour ordeal and he had no 
clue how to end it or how to get out of it other than just telling them what they wanted what to they hear. What they wanted to hear. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And that's exactly. And then immediately saying, I mean, he kind of started out saying he didn't know anything about it. And then he ended up after he quote unquote confessed saying, no, I didn't do it. <laughs> so he did end up back where he began, but it was still, the jury had made up their mind. So it just is what it is. And yeah. that's it. So and that's it. yeah. And that's it. So the jury, you know, convicted him and they did sentence him. So he was, uh, he was sentenced. In fact, it looks like they sentenced him that day. Um, let's see. It says that he was sentenced to 40 years in prison. Uh, and it does say that he was sent to a facility in Pine Bluff. And which facility is that? Do you know that facility? I don't know the name of it. Okay. Um, I have to look it up. Yeah. Pine Bluff is a little South of, of Little Rock. Yeah. So yeah. this would have been, you know, and of course, West Memphis is in the very eastern tip part of our state. And, and Little Rock's just right in the center. So to give people an idea. So it would have taken his parents, what, two, three hours to even get to that facility. To Pine Bluff from, the, yeah, about two yes. hours or more, okay. probably. Yes. So Bless his heart. Okay, I know. So, so that's it for part two. And yes. um, everyone needs to stay tuned because part three will be coming up shortly. Yes, we're going to work on it. So, and, do, oh, and go listen, go message listen, us. Like, yes. share, and tell your friends. Yes. Love All it. right, we'll see y'all soon. Bye. Thank you.